Welcome to the HMO Success Podcast. I'm delighted to be with you today. I'm your host, Wendy Whitaker-Large, and I'm, as always, here to help you grow a profitable HMO portfolio. So my guest today is probably well known to you. If you've been a listener to the podcast for a while, you would have heard his dulcet tones on previous episodes. But I'm really pleased to welcome him back because um, this is a guy who I have learned a lot from not just about HMOs and property, but also about investing, about money, about money markets, and also about family and the importance of having time and energy and money to do what you like with your life. And that's a very important part of what my guest today does. So let me give you a, a proper introduction because uh, he is a, a very rounded individual. Paul Lanfear is the man I'm talking about today. And Paul obtained a first class law degree and started his professional life as a barrister. So he knows a lot about the law. He later qualified as a solicitor, practicing in commercial, banking and finance litigation for 10 years. And he's worked in London and Leeds for two of the world's leading law firms. But he did all this before leading a demanding qualification program for prospective barristers. And then he started a family. And he became an award-winning property entrepreneur, investor, developer, and multiple business owner. So I'm delighted to welcome Paul Lanfear to the podcast, who badges himself today, focused on mentoring, family, and surfing. Great to have you here today, Paul. It is an absolute pleasure to be here, Wendy. You've dragged me away from the beach, but I'm I'm I'm, I'm content with that. <laughs> and I am genuinely very flattered by your kind words in the introduction. They they do mean a lot to me, Wendy. You know that I have I hold you in the highest of esteem, and it's a real pleasure to be back on the podcast with you. And hopefully, we can have an interesting conversation and make some progress and help people. Absolutely, absolutely. So. Paul, I start my podcast now with a, a series of quick fire questions. Uh, I think there's about five questions here for you today. So mm -hmm. the, these are the rules. You have to answer in either one word or okay. yes or no. Okay. Or if you really can't keep it to one word, I will allow you a very short sentence. Okay. I love are it. Are you okay Let's with go. those rules? Yeah, yeah, yeah. hundred percent. Let's go. Right. Let's fire away. So number one, do you think systems are vital for growth? Yes. What is the most important thing you're focusing on right now? Uh, reinvestment. Is scaling up your business always the best idea? Absolutely not. Are low cost or no cost tools always the best approach when you're starting up? Oh, I would say so. Definitely. How important is ensuring that your family and loved ones are on board when you're starting a property business? I would say that's the most important thing. Fantastic. Wow, you did really well there. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's quite difficult sometimes because some of those questions are quite leading questions and you might have wanted to go, oh, can I just say something a bit more? No, no, I like those. I think they're really clear questions. They're good. But, but you answered them very well. So today, Paul, I thought that it would be great to um, get your views on this year. Mm -hmm. um, we're just recording this at the end of January. It will go out beginning of Feb, this particular episode. Um, and one of the, the topics that I think you're, you know, really good at talking about is that blending of lifestyle with investing. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we mentioned a little bit beforehand about finding flow, getting more done than ever before in 2024. Mm -hmm. So can you just kind of outline what, what are your thoughts about how you're going to be doing that this year? How are you going to find flow, not mm -hmm. just in your surfing, but that's a major way in which you find flow, but in other areas of your life in, in 2024? So I think the starting point is always a little bit of reflection. So I think it's very tempting at this time of the year Particularly, you know, with the social media environment where we have, where people are like immediately post posting their goals on the 1st of January and like good for them. If, you know, people are in that space, good for them, totally. But I also think it's useful before we bolt out of the gates to have a period of reflection and ask ourselves, like, what are the lessons that we learned, you know, from the, the previous year? And, you know, less, so lessons, for example, that I learned, I had um, a fire in a building first ever fire I've ever had, had in a building, first insur proper insurance claim I've ever made in my life. Um, and what I learned from that is 
all the boring attention to detail that myself and my lovely uh, wife and business partner, the lovely Liz Lanfrey, attend to on a weekly basis in our director's meetings does pay dividends in the end. You know, making sure the reinstatement values are spot on, making sure we've attended to all the detail. I can tell you the first thing the loss adjuster said as he got out of his car, who I have to say is a really easy, really easy guy to deal with. He's a decent straight up guy. First thing he said to me is just to let you know, your documents really need to be in order. And if they're not, it's likely this claim will not be paid. For example, if it is a rent to rent and you haven't got... Um, direct ASTs with your tenants, you will not be covered by this policy. And I, I was content that our paperwork was, was was in order. But I mean, that that does wake you up. You know, that does that, that does wake you up and make, and make you think about that. So, you know, that was one of the big lessons for us. I mean, hopefully we won't have one of those for a long, long time. Well, that also brought to the fourth, fourth front as well is, you know, what is the current state of play with build costs, the availability of good contractors and those kind of things? I can happily tell you, not happily tell you, but like honestly tell you, the refurbishment, which is going now into six figures for this for this HMO, is well over twice what it would have been five years ago. You know, mm. it's absolutely astonishing. You know, and I've um, brought in you know really trusted people to talk, you know, to go through it with. I'm very fortunate to have like a really fantastic group of people around me you know, and sense checking everything with them. And, you know, they're telling me that this is just the realities of life. This is where we're at now in you know, 2024. So ensure, attending to the detail, and I'm not a detail person, I have to say, um, things like, you know, the boring bits, in my view, the insurance, you know, making sure they're very much on point, you know, and contractually got everything in order. And just, I think, waking up to the reality, which we are all aware of, which is, we have been living in a, an inflationary environment. It's irrelevant what the CPI number is. Um, it It's what you're actually having to pay to get the work that you want to do. And just hovering a little bit over cost of living on, the, on that notice, we do a, a process every year, Liz and I, where we review what our base costs are. So what the costs are for us to operate as a family. And, and then we have the discretionary costs after that. But we look at our base costs first of all. Um, because it's one of the key calculations we do to ensure that we remain financially free. And our base costs went up 20% last year, mm. 20%, you know? So unless you're factoring that in, in terms of growth in revenue, growth, op, you know, oper, you know, keeping a, an eye on operating costs and overheads, driving it to the bottom line, you might be working just as hard as ever, but actually for less money and actually for less life. And that's not a game um, that we we want to engage with. Liz has got this lovely expression, which is, you know, when we look at the value of a project or look at the return of an, an investment, uh, she never talks in terms of money. She goes, how much life has that bought you, Paul? Uh, you know, and if, if you can deliver a project that delivers you a year of freedom, um, that is that is worth fighting for that is worth a pay uh, even if you're not a detail, a detail i'm not a detail person it, it makes it worth attending to the detail you know i think you've touched on some really really interesting areas there paul and i think one of the things that's always very much impressed me about you and liz and i i, I also um a, very, very fortunate to know the lovely Liz Lanfear, who uh is is a mastermind in her own right mm -hmm. but tends mm -hmm. to stay you know behind the scenes um is that what i've what i've seen the the two of you be extremely good at is financial management and financial awareness of um other investing assets other uh, uh, other pots where you can put your money to to get a return so not just simply property yes mm -hmm. you're known to be a property entrepreneur you've developed many different hmos you've you're very experienced when it comes to property mm -hmm. but aside from that it's clear that you also understand the much much bigger world of money and obviously and you have a podcast and and you've interviewed some big names when it comes to to finances and money but it's interesting to me that it almost starts with your own domestic environment that if you can manage and master that your mm -hmm. own cash flow your own income and outgoings that's actually where good money management begins but you need someone like liz what would you suggest to people who don't have a liz lanfear um well i mean it's 
it's tricky, isn't it? And there's only one list to go around, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> She's and taken. I've, and I've got, I've got her. So <laughs> unfortunate for you. So um, I think on a more serious note, I mean, it's worth hovering that over that as a, a point. I mean, the single best investment anyone will ever make is obviously in themselves, um, their well-being, their learning, their growth. Um, you know, and things like, you know, it, it, I, I remember when it dawned on me what my my superpower was or one of my superpowers and it's the fact that i am committed to being a lifelong learner you know i learn things every day and i implement them and some things work and some things don't some things are, have created you know a real significant contribution towards our wealth uh, and other things have been less prosperous and we therefore we wouldn't wouldn't necessarily re repeat them so obviously the main invest but the primary investment is in one one of ourselves. And, and I mean that entirely holistically as well, you know, spiritually, physically, emotionally, phys uh, you know, mentally, everything. But the second best invest investment is in our life partner. And I was sharing with someone else that I deeply love this week um, that the decision you make around your life par partner is probably one of the most important you'll ever make. And... Um, you know, because it has such a big impact on your well-being um, and everything that, that flows from there. And indeed, obviously, your economic circumstances as well. Um, so I suppose how to deal directly with the question of, you know, how to approach the, the money at home. I think the key, the key thing, as ever, you know, is that lesson from Stephen Covey. What's the end? What's the end in mind? always to start with the, the end in mind and what you are orientated towards so liz and i are orientated to freedom freedom family and wealth and wealth for us largely means security uh, it means that we can um you, all of our decisions are, are made with a focus on security that's not to say we haven't taken enormous risks over the years which of course we have and We've put the risk on and then we've taken it off and then we've put it back on. We've taken it off and we've reassessed where, where we're at. I suppose, so then it, so then it's a question of, well, how, how do you attend to your financial plumbing system? Um, it's what's the end in mind? Where are you now? And how do we want to get there? Um, it's very, very difficult to make meaningful progress, I think, in a business if personally you are in negative cash flow. Uh, I think there's practically it's quite difficult. I also think spiritually and emotionally it's quite difficult as well. Um, uh, so the first step would be to try and get cash flow positive by any means necessary. And I don't mean go out and commit crime. You know, <laughs> uh, I am no longer able to represent you in that capacity. But <laughs> I, I mean, in the sense of, you know, even if it's a part time job or doing a bit of freelancing or doing con some consultancy work for a job. Well, some you... sometimes it's cutting your expenses, isn't it? Yeah. Sometimes we're not ruthless enough at cutting our expenses. Whatever it is to go cash flow positive or at least to have a um, forecast as to when you will become cash flow positive. Because from time to time in our lives, you know, with all the different things and, you know, I, I, one of the people I interviewed in the podcast who'd done over a billion a billion in property transactions. You know, one of the things he was talking was about the, he, to me about was that you know when you sell a business, you might discover actually you're no longer cash flow positive because you've sold the you know the business. In which case, you then need to attend to your your circumstances again, re redo your plumbing, and then you go back to being cash flow positive. Yes, and I think that's a great point. That again, referring to different asset classes. Um, you know, the eventual uh, uh, positive outflow from a property business would be that you can somehow sell uh, an aspect of that. It might not be that you want to actually sell the bricks and mortar. My exit strategy is death. And I suspect that's probably yours as well, Paul, mm -hmm. because you want to pass it on to the next generation, your daughter, namely. Um, but uh, there are other ways in which you can, of course, create side businesses from property. For mm -hmm. example, we've set up a letting agency. So the letting agency manages all our properties for free. We also have external clients that we manage their properties using our experience in HMOs and, and other investments. And that business itself is a standalone business that gives us cash flow. If at some point we decide 
you know, we want, we want to go and do something else. We could potentially package up that business and sell it. Mm -hmm. And that would then enable us to uh, do something else. Assuming, as you say, that the, 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 the finances uh, that we get for, for selling that business um, equates to enough money that we could then reinvest to give us to make up for the cash flow that we would have lost. Mm -hmm. um, so you you it's always about moving money from one asset to another to be able to 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 add, to add value and to create value mm -hmm. and 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 absolutely to keep an eye on what you're actually investing in now and is it is it in those those right pots um but just going back to to obviously liz plays a, a major role in terms of your your family finance in terms of making sure that you know the the, the de details are there and as you rightly say that that itself is an insurance policy against your your um, portfolio um mm -hmm. you know that example of the insurance is a classic one isn't it that all of us can find that suddenly an event occurs and if we haven't got the right paperwork in place we suddenly realize the value of having somebody in our team who mm -hmm. is the detail person even if we're not even if in let's say in roger james hamilton's wealth dynamics profile we're the creator or the star yeah, exactly. we're not we're not on the left hand side we're not the lords we're not the mechanics we're not the accumulators if you're the star, if you're the person with the energy, uh, I think I suspect you're probably a star, Paul. Mm -hmm, I am. <laughs> yes, it takes on to no one. <laughs> um, you, you know, your energy is building relationships. Uh, it, it's promoting the business. It's building a brand. Um, it, 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 it's 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 connecting people. Whereas um, if if Liz is more on the left hand side, she's perhaps more of a lord or a, or a mechanic. Mm -hmm. Then mm -hmm. her strength is going to be in in if you like tying up all the dots, making sure that all the loose ends are tied up and making sure that the strategy is clarified so that yeah. everybody can move forward. Um, but not everybody's got those those team members in place yet. Um, so what would, what would you say to somebody who's perhaps starting their business? Or maybe they've got a few HMOs, they've got a small property business already, maybe they've got a couple of single buy to lets. You know, the portfolio is reasonably sized, perhaps between five and seven properties, for example. So they're not a complete newbie. Mm -hmm. But they're on that. I find that, that that's the cusp where people either decide to, to hold and not grow, mm -hmm. or they decide to go off in a different direction and try a different strategy, mm -hmm. or they decide they're going to grow. But that is often the most scary path. Mm -hmm. What what advice would you give to somebody? Because you've you've been there, you've done mm -hmm. that. What mm -hmm. what what happened on your path to growth? Um, so our path to growth was we I suppose were a little naive and we kind of bought into the whole empire builder version of 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 things you know and i i take complete responsibility for that you know i take for every you know i believe in personal responsibility let's be absolutely clear about that we are the makers of our fortune and also the creators of all of our own misfortune as well generally speaking um but a lot of the personalities in the property space who you hear a lot from are nearly always empire builders and they're nearly always sort of for if you look at Roger Hamilton's really fantastic um, uh, Wealth Dynamics profiling tool, which I'm a great fan of and hopefully we can return to in a minute. Um, you know, they're normally at the top, you know, they're a creator, often are a creator mechanic, that kind of thing. Um, and they've got very, very, very loud voices. And, you th you know, you think that that's, that's the only direction of travel. So, I mean, we went right through the gears, you know, so we used reasonably high risk uh, financial products that were available at the time to scale very, very quickly. Um, we were doing multiple projects and, you know, even with your own money, you tied up in projects for at least a year. You know, uh, the convincing takes too long in this country. It's ridiculous. Planning is just a total failure. Um, so we would reach out to our friends and family investors and say, look, we've got these projects on the go. We've got, a, you know, our money's coming out, but we're probably gonna have to wait a year. You know, can we do something with you? And we were very keen to remain compliant. So we used one one investor for what, for each project and all the rest of it. But that allowed us to grow at scale. We, you know, we had a couple of partnerships and joint ventures in there as well with people that we knew closely. Um, and then we did some of the more creative stuff on top, like rent to rent, purchase lease, purchase lease options, and then put a layer of man management clients on top. What that ultimately meant is we peaked out about 
236 tenants. And obviously the cash flow was astonishing. It was you know more money than I had experienced before in my, my life, even having had a successful career in the law. But it brought you know a whole stream of of challenges and i suppose to summarize those challenges it was like you know why are we doing this you know that's that's the question and simultaneously um i lost a really good friend of mine in, in property who you know you know phil and um it, it was the coming it was the combination of an, a series of events including the loss of phil that made me really ask that question to myself why are we doing this? You know, why are we doing this? And we've always been around freedom, lifestyle, family, um, you know, having a fabulous relationship. So it that was the opportunity for us to then scale back and strip back, deleverage. Uh, you know, we don't owe any investors any capital. We've got a very, very low leverage in our portfolio. We've just got pristine assets. They're just, you know, the best, the best possible assets. So we scaled, you know, using a whole range of different strategies. The end product was always a HMO. Um, but now we've gone through another cycle, which is the deleveraging and uh, certainly a degree of systemization. And I'm happy to talk about that in a bit more detail as well. Um, and that's, you know, that's how we progressed. And now we've got a lean, profitable, uh, I would say, largely speaking, low maintenance portfolio. I mean, there's always a few surprises, as I say, having a fire is one of them. Um, but otherwise, you know, we've got the space and time to think about other things, as well as obviously, you know, progressing property projects when they, they meet the criteria. So you now have a mean, lean money machine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's good. So, yeah, that, that's really interesting. And in fact, a number of people I've interviewed recently um, have talked about paying down their portfolio, pay, paying down the mortgages on the portfolio or the lending on the portfolio, either by paying back the investors or starting to pay off some of those mortgages as well. Now, do you see that as being a product of the, the times or might I be so bold and perhaps impolite, Paul, to say it's a product of your age? <laughs> Oh, I think it's definitely, a, 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 you know, so I'm almost 50. So obviously that's a... a that's You're a spring a, chicken. It's just still a spring chicken. But, you know, I felt very, very differently about these things in my 30s. You know, I, I you know, my attitude was, um, you know, provided all the numbers work, you know, let's, let's, let's progress at haste. Um, I think things have changed, though. You know, we were operating in a ze effectively zero interest rate environment. Um, fairly steady growth in uh, despite you know a few hiccups along the way fairly steady upward growth and um you know capital growth in portfolios i think is underrated you know everybody talks about cash flow but you know many of us discover that actually the capital growth is is very often the thing um particularly around legacy and all the rest of it and then it's about the numbers isn't it you know it's astonishing what um deleveraging can do you know when your loan to values are like below 60 the rates that you're getting offered are very very favorable everything seems to get much easier i have to say uh, and obviously your cash flow improves you know if you're paying over like four figures a month in interest payments to your investors i mean that is that is a burden there is a weight to that there is a psychological price you pay uh for that and some people love it and they, you know, they just want more of it. Um, and but other people, you know, have different aspirations. What I would say as well, and I don't like I'm not intending to add a, a, any negativity to the podcast. But, you know, last year I discovered that four of the mentors that I had had 10 years ago have put their companies into administration. You know, and I and, and many of them I you know, consider friends, you know, uh, respect, you know, mm. very much respected their work. but you know they're putting their companies into administration um many of the people yeah. that I, i've had i've had exactly the same paul I, you know, i've had I, yeah i've stood next same to people on stage who have lost you know tens of millions and millions and millions of pounds of people's money and i know those people as well and i've they've, mm -hmm. you know i've 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 seen their tears i've 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 heard them tell me they've lost their family's life savings you know mm -hmm. so um I, 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 that's got to play into the factor as well. You know, it's not all rock and roll, is it? Sometimes, no, you know, no, absolutely. And I, I think 
that's where sometimes slow and steady wins the race. And, and I've always said I'm a bit of a tortoise when it comes to property investing. I do things slow and steadily, partly because my other half, my better half, Andy, is a bit like that. He would rather do a good project that gives a good return that uh, we we don't have to borrow lots and lots of money for. Maybe short time, as you say, short term lending, short term finance has its place. And we've certainly used bridging. We've certainly I've raised a lot of money from investors. I don't uh, do I owe any money? Yes, I have one small pot of money that I owe to one particular investor from London, but everything else has been paid back. Uh, so the same as you. And you're absolutely right. The other the other issue, of course, about borrowing at lower loan to value levels is if you buy in, if you bought in your own name. Uh, so Section 24, of course, has a very, very big impact as as rents go up um, that you, you know, it, it, anybody who maybe had a small portfolio and you could just about maybe st stay under that higher uh, mm -hmm. tax earning that, the, you know, the personal tax threshold. Now you're thrown into the higher rate and, and you know, you lose 80 percent of the ability to claim those mortgages. Well, if you haven't got very big mortgages, mm -hmm. then that 80 percent actually on an, in a nominal term is much lower. So mm -hmm. there are many reasons why you might want to look at deleveraging and, and as opposed to having 10 properties on 70% loan to value, perhaps have five or six on 40% loan to value and mm -hmm. you can sleep at night. And mm -hmm. I think certainly I would say at my age, sleep is a very valuable commodity. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and, I, and I think it's horses for courses. Like we're all very different and unique creatures, aren't we? I, I, I think all I would recommend which has certainly benefited to us let's say in the last half a decade is pause for breath every year and have a look at what's going on attend to the detail speak to the accountants speak to the tax advisors see what the direction of travel is and then decide what the best thing is to do scaling can be enormous fun you know i mean uh we were doing we were crit crit you know i've done over over 50 hmo refurbs you know we were doing one a, one a month and I, I was really the thing that used to make us laugh is we would go into a HMO and the, and the trick was to make it so perfect and so much like the last one that you couldn't tell which HMO you were in. Um, and that was just good fun. And, you know, the team worked really well, we had good systems. There was a, a good sense of collaboration. Uh, people had a lot of autonomy, so they would just solve the problems for me. And, you know, a week later, I'd find out that there was this problem, but it's been solved. You know, we had a great time as well. So I'm not you know, if people listen to the podcast, they want to put the accelerator down and have and have a bit of fun with it, you know, go for it. Perhaps we should caveat, though, that there are FCA rules and regulations in place. Uh, you have to make sure that you're doing things legally and, and in, you know, properly compliantly. Mm -hmm. uh, that That's really, really critical. You know, you may be dealing with other people's money, whether it's bank money or whether it's investor finance or even if, actually if it's your own money. OK, there's less compliance in that factor, but it's important that you you you, you recognize and learn about those aspects, I think, of, of investing as well. Uh, so, on, on on that point, one of my favourite things I've ever heard about using investor money is from Helen Chorley, who was on the podcast, and she said, if you're borrowing money, you have to treat it like the mafia's money. And that mm -hmm. is definitely true. And I have actually acted for a, mem a peripheral member of the Japanese mafia, which are called the Yakuza. He was a, a, he was a money launderer. Uh, he was a, 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 it is alleged that he was an accidental money launderer for the Japanese mafia. I should say that very carefully. Um, <laughs> but... Um, uh, he is no longer with us. He disappeared rather tragically. And I suspect that's why well, I know why that will be. So um, you've got to treat you've got to treat it like the mafia's money. You've got to treat it very, very carefully um, with respect and, you know, attend to the detail as always. So let's talk a little bit about systems. And I haven't ignored what you said about the Wealth Dynamics profile, Roger Hamilton's, which we mm -hmm. will come on to, because I, I find that very, very interesting. Again, probably because of STAR, you know, I like people. So for me, it's how people tick, how you build a team, yep. how, how how you encourage your team to sort of be bought into your vision and get them to do their roles. But we'll come on to that in a moment. But let me first of all talk about systems. Now, I find in property circles that people either love or hate systems. There doesn't tend to be many people who are sort of ambivalent. They're either really good system people and they love it and they've got a spreadsheet for everything. And, you know, even, you know, date night is a spreadsheet or they are absolutely that's like anathema to them. They can't stand it. They're not they don't have any systems in place and they're really bad at it. But they're very good at talking to people and they're very good at kind of doing deals and getting out there and, you know, actually make it work on the ground. Yeah. 
I think I could probably guess what kind of person you are, Paul. <laughs> but but help me understand. You 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 mentioned earlier you're absolutely committed to growth. One of your your uh, mm-hmm. core values is not. You've mentioned freedom, of course, family, mm-hmm. but also growth. Mm-hmm. So how have you grown as a property investor who's perhaps not naturally given to systems? What have you had to do to learn about it? So the answer for me is through people. You know, it's this thing of of not how, but actually who. So, and we can draw some threads together here quite hopefully reasonably well. So if we start off with the Wealth Dynamics profiling tool and we sit and say, we identify that I am a star. So stars are driven by shining a light on projects and people and causes which they believe in. Um, and that that is me all over. Like I'm more driven by a cause than any anything. And, and it, the cause might be my own family. Let's be completely honest about that. But it could also be like, you know, charities and some other bits and pieces that we get involved with um, or the general progress of the people around us, because I'm a great believer that as the tide rises, all the boats in the harbour get lifted by it. And that's what we need. And that's how we're all going to benefit. So start with this profiling tool which is really easy to do you answer a few questions answer it honestly don't pretend to be something you're not and it gives you a profile and and all the rest of it so that identifies me as a a, a star so then when it comes to systemization there are different elements of the business that need to be delivered but for me the starting point is to find the person who can deliver that element of the business and then In many ways, they have the responsibility for the system. So um, I have, I'd like to say I have never done a refurbishment. I accidentally did one um, and it was a terrible idea and I hated it. So So the system for me is to appoint a competent project manager and to attempt to be the best possible client to this project manager by providing clear instructions, by being patient and by paying my invoices just as soon as they are are delivered and, you know, being cooperative and working as a a team. Equally, um, the finance element of a business is absolutely crucial. So a lot of the training that I did had this strap line, you know, property is a people business. Yes, I'm sure it is. But what I discovered is it's actually got a lot to do with financial management. And in my my world, it has more to do with managing money than anything else. Um, so in order, so my profile does not have an abundance of what are called the winter energies, the steel energies, which are all to do with attention to detail. So I really, really invest in people who have that and they're called lords. Uh, there's no religious connotation to that. Um, but, you know, really good financial controller, really good accountant, really good tax advisor. Every month, detailed management accounts, frequently updating the balance sheet and looking at it with a lot of care, making sure all the risk has been been managed. So it starts with the people and then the systems follow from there. So to give you a concrete example of that, um, one of the obvious bits of virtually free software which has made such a difference to us is zero and i know you know most people in the property space probably use zero now you know moving from the spreadsheets to the zero at the earliest opportunity for what it costs which is just you know not much um has made absolutely all the difference and the and the way that we approached it as an example of what we've been discussing is that rich our financial controller he set up the zero for us so he said, right, you need zero. And then he set up all of our charts of accounts. He set up our balance sheet. He, uh, we had the bank feed set up. It's actually much easier to do it nowadays than it used to be. Like nowadays, any I think anybody can do it. And then we had this fully, uh, fully, fully functioning system, which I would not have done on my own. So I found the person. They gave me the system. We implemented the system together. They have large responsibility for driving, driving it, and I deal with any questions that arrive. And in the and the deliverable in that instance is management accounts every month, which Liz and I go through very, very, very carefully. Um, and you know we make really big strategic decisions on. You know I have 
behind my breakfast, I have this inner circle mentoring group. And one of the things that people who have portfolios like to do, and this is not me asking them to do it, but they come to me is, is we look at our um, p and and I'll go through it and I'll listen to what the challenges that they're, they're facing. And between us, we'll discuss different options for different assets. You know, there are some assets that uh, if you've held them for a long, long time, it may not actually be worth keeping them anymore, you know, because the world has changed. And if you've got six figures plus of equity in them and there's some other exciting stuff you want to do and you don't really want to raise external finance, there's opportunities to, you know, yes, you're going to pay a bit of tax, but you might, if you get to do the project of your dreams or something that really sets your heart on fire, you know, let's go for it. One thing you mentioned there, Paul, which I think is really valuable. Um, first of all, I love the way that you touch on the fact that for you, a system is not a spreadsheet. A system starts with a person. Yeah. And that's because of your energy, your 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 focus, which is out with yourself. And it's it's an external uh, extrovert energy. So it's very much all about people. But, but uh, to interrupt you, there, it's also because I'm not omnicompetent. So there are people who walk this earth uh, who are genuinely omnicompetent. You know, they are good at everything. And I've met them. So one minute they'll be doing, you know, their books. The next minute they'll pop around the corner to fit a bathroom. Then they'll be doing some <laughs> tiling in the kitchen. Um, the wife or husband absolutely loves them to pieces. Their kids think they're fa fabulous. And you see them walk the earth and you just think, oh, I wish I was like that when I was I've grown up. But I'm not. I know I'm not, you know, I cannot put up, a, pe you know, uh, some shelves for the life of me. <laughs> and, why, and, you know, why would I, I want to? So it's an acknowledgement in my case that in all circumstances, other than a handful of things, there are people better than me at that task. And it's about using those people. For example, I was doing a look at a project last year and I reached out to somebody who comes to my breakfast group who've got really enormous respect for that delivers great projects. And I was like, would you, could you do me a, I want to pay you to do an appraisal for one of my projects. And he sent me this message, a slightly awkward message saying, what's this about? Like, why, Paul? You've done so many projects. You really know what you're doing. Why do you need me? And I said, look, I want, I just really value your opinion. I want to pay you to look at one of my projects and, and just tell me how you would do it. And, you know, he sent me his invoice. I paid it there and then on the phone. He came came round and we both learned a lot from the process, I think. And it was fantastic. You know, leverage, you know, leverage people. Um, you know, you see these speakers on stage who uh, would it would appear they emerged from the womb as perfect human beings in all respects and have never encountered any failure or challenge in their in their lives. I mean, that's just not a true reflection of reality. And not with a few exceptions most of us are not omni -com competent um and i think the final piece piece on that is you know when you do the wealth dynamics profiling tool in one of the brochures that you get you have the picture that says you know if i think it's an einstein quote which is you know if you ask a tree if you ask a fish to, to climb a, a tree or think that it will spend all its life feeling it like it's stupid and i think that's true for so many of us um it's uh, to find flow, we need to leverage ourselves, use the best people that we, we have available to us, focus on the things that we're really good at. Um, because not only does that benefit us, but that's how we all progress. You know, if you're giving someone an, a task to do and they're really good at, good at it and they're getting well paid for it, that's how there are societal benefits in that as well, aren't there? Absolutely. Um, I think that is the quote of the podcast, Paul. <laughs> I think that's like you've hit the nail on the head there. That's exactly what flow is all about. I, I once heard um, uh, a speaker say that a system saves yourself, will save yourself stress, time, energy and money. That's what system stands for. And I thought that was a great acronym because mm -hmm. that is the idea, isn't it? That a system enables you to grow because you're not um, d doing the things that are required. You're doing what you need to do in your strength to grow the business. But other people uh, will do some of the other things. I also just want to touch on something, though, that you mentioned um, a couple of times, which is that you have a regular meeting 
And mm. it feels to me that one of the marks of a successful business is creating a rhythm in the business. Mm. And I remember once talking to you about this, oh, a few years ago, about mm. a team meeting. And you gave me some extremely good advice then um, about how to manage the team from mm. the beginning to the end of the week. So mm. it would be great if you could share what what rhythm have you created in your business that mm -hmm. allows you to examine your, your management accounts, set your goals, mm -hmm. uh, ensure that everything's on track. I love the I love this question. And um we in our one of our meetings use a model which you shared with Liz and I. So that's gonna be fun to send that back to <laughs> all yes. So we're building on foundations of the wealth dynamic profiling tool. And just to be really clear, I have no horse in this race. So I'm not a practitioner, I don't have an affiliate code and all of, all the rest of it. I offer this in just genuine good good pay. But one of the when you do more detailed work on it, one of the things that Roger advocates is finding a flow to your week. And he gives you a particular methodology to do it, which is in one of his books called The Millionaire Master Plan, which I'm going to see over my, uh, just behind my, my screen on the shelf. Um, so my week is, is designed like that. I think also you've got to remember I spent a decade in the law. So I spent a decade charging for every 10 minute unit of my time. So my time is really, really pressure. There, there is really very little more than I value than, than my, my time. And I absolutely cannot stand to have my time wasted. So it, that, that's like the other side of that, that coin as well. Uh, and I rarely, very rarely do. I have to say I'm very fortunate in that respect. So this is the way it works. Don't wake up, you know, 1st of January. Well, no, don't wake up on the 1st of first, first January, even before then. Between Christmas and New Year, study the teachings of John C. Maxwell and his book, The 15 Invaluable Laws of Growth, and do the exercise that he recommends in, the, in a chapter called The Law of Design, which asks you to really review your year and decide what you want to do more of, what you want to um, uh, do, uh, what do you want to kind of keep in place and what you want to eliminate altogether. Um, and that final question has become more and more important over the years for me. You know, every year something is eliminated. I don't go to certain places, don't follow certain people, don't do certain things. And what I've noticed is that I've become lighter, more creative and all the rest of it. It's, it's an awesome thing to do. And then think about John C. Maxwell. What's the direction of travel? What's the end in mind? You know, you can do the punchy version. What do I want people to say about me? Um, when I'm dead. Um, and it's really funny. I'm going to really ensure I don't get emotional about this because I do want to make pro progress in the podcast. But one of the, the things that most hit me in the world is someone I did a podcast with and they said, you're the kindest person I've ever met, Paul. Mm. Um, and that has a lot to do with it. But I'm, I, I can't say any more on that because it will, unfortunately, push you're me well right off the edge quite quickly. <laughs> so, um, so work out, you know, your direction of travel, including what you want people to say about you. And then once you've got your direction of travel, understand, you know, the hard, the, the harsh deliverables, you know, around, for example, finances, how we're going to manage those and all the rest of that. And then break the year into quarters, break the year uh, down, and then work out monthly what we have to do, weekly and daily. And I would naturally say, put all the life in first. So, you know, get, get all the, in our case, we don't do work the school holidays. So we do all the adventures in the school holidays. Drilling it down specifically to your question then, with all that in mind, all the preparation, the, our, my week is built on the Wealth Dynamics model. So Monday is detail, financials. I literally went on, onto my phone, I'll do a only email right at the end of the day. And it is literally all of the financials of the business, P&Ls, balance sheets, forecasts, understanding exactly what, what's coming on. And even though it's not in my wealth dynamic profile to be uplifted by those activities, it, it now genuinely brings me so much joy because I'm fully in control of the, of the ship. And it is, my duty as well like it is my responsibility no one else is going to do it i am the best person to do it that is my job as the business owner and that's so interesting you say that because that's exactly the same for me paul 
in our business and in our life, I basically am the financial control mm-hmm. or the financial director. Mm-hmm. If I think we've got a bit of surplus here and we need to invest it and put it into our ISO or our SIP or our SAS, or we need to move it around or we need to pay off this loan or mortgage or uh, there's an opportunity to buy a property and, 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 and do it or whatever, I'm the driving force behind that. While as a team, we may evaluate a, a, a project and we may bring in other people. Oh, I have a very good builder, actually, who regularly I'll be messaging just mm-hmm. pop in, why, you know, why don't you pop in for, for half an hour cup of tea when you come home from your building site, Mark, because I need to talk to you. Um, and he's really, really good. Like like your friend, he, he's an expert. And to me, I think you need expert witnesses in your business who you can bring in uh, mm-hmm. to help you appraise. Is there something I've missed? Is there something that I haven't calculated for? Yes, I may have done this many, many times, but I just still want to double check for somebody else. And there's no harm in doing that. But I, I also find that having a very good understanding and knowledge of the whole financial picture of where we are and where we're going. Yes, it gives me security. And that, of course, feeds into my my value as well. My highest value is freedom. So Mm -hmm. it enables me to do that. But it also allows me to be creative. Mm -hmm. It also allows me to make creative decisions fun mm-hmm. decisions mm-hmm. uh so for example in the summer we're going to south uh south america for three weeks um mm-hmm. we're going to go, uh, do the inca trail we're going to machu picchu we're going to bolivia to see our we we foster some children in bolivia we foster about six children in bolivia we're going to see them um and we're going to go to colombia as well not to do anything <laughs> illegal <laughs> but just because why not yeah uh, country. and it's going to be yeah it will be an amazing adventure but knowing, you know, what that's going to take in terms of resources, planning for it, being mm-hmm. being confident that that's manageable, you know, achievable, et cetera. For me, that gives me a tremendous sense of pleasure because I think everything, all the, all the boxes are ticked, all the mm-hmm. systems are running, you know, even with a bit of tolerance, uh, which you, you need to have built into the system, this is a possibility. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it's, it's interesting that maybe within our wealth dynamic, we wouldn't have expected for us to be very, very good at financial management, but it somehow comes with the territory. I don't know what it is, but maybe that's because we're stars. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I think if it is naturally your weakest hand, organically, if you take out learnt behaviour and training and and what have you, then it makes sense to front load it into the beginning of the week. You know, you've got to eat that frog first, as Brian Tracy would say. So financials on a, on a Monday, lots of attention to detail, not on my phone. Um, Tuesday is the Tempo Energy, which is all about team. So we have a, a formal, Liz and I have a formal director's meeting every Tuesday. And then we have appointments with members of the team you know just for as long as is necessary and that's that's the day so um and and people are aware of this so the financial controller knows to have reports to us on a monday morning team members know that their time is on a tuesday and that we're you know nearly always available to to go through that and then we have a a a process to the director's meeting which i think was invented invented by the Lundy, uh, the lovely Wendy Whitaker Large. Uh, <laughs> the stock. I think process, it probably was <laughs> strategy, team, operations, and performance. So we use that as our process. Great, um, love it. With a few built bolt-ons as well. It's a good and one, then, isn't it? It, it oh, does it's, work. It's it fantastic. Work. It's fan- fantastic. And again, it's a system. It's it's a repeatable system. You just do the system, repeat, and obviously improve it as you go. So then, by Tuesday night, I have done my duty. And that's it. I've done my, my duty. The portfolio is well managed. I've I've carried out all of my responsibilities. And then it is basically fun for the rest of the week. So on Wednesdays, I'll do my podcasts. I'll do, you know, write articles. I'll, I'll um, you know, do the creative stuff, like write stuff for my inner circlers and all the rest of it. And then Thursday uh, is my kind of spirit day. So I'll go surfing and I will take... If I'm reading a report on something, I might I'll chuck that in as well and I'll read that, you know, over a coffee afterwards or what have you. And then Friday is my people day. And so I do my breakfast meeting. I do my inner circle mentoring. I do my one to one calls with those guys. I do my meetups with those guys all on a Friday, at which point I am just having the best time of my life, you know, because I've met 
all of my human needs. I'm meeting all of my human needs. I've attended to the detail. I've done my duty. I've created all the things I've wanted to do. I've connected with nature and spirit and all the rest of it. And then by Friday, it's just having being of service, having a great time. Um, and th that's not to say I'm not thoroughly exhausted by the time I get to a Friday night, but it's a, it's a happy, it's a happy exhaustion, you know? It sounds a beautifully designed week, Paul. Mm -hmm. And and I, I, I'm sitting here sort of gasping in astonishment, frankly, because I think that sounds absolutely wonderful. And you've really thought it through incredibly well. And you've thought through about where your energy is as well, and what kind of energy you have at different times in the week. And, and that's really, you know, incredibly useful to hear. So this is obviously talking about flow, how mm -hmm. you can grow your flow in 2024, how you can make sure that you maximize your own energy patterns. And I'm, I'm sure that for uh, somebody who isn't a star, they, they people who are may be able to relate to that, but other people who have different types of energy on that wealth dynamic profile may say, well, that doesn't really suit me. I need to, I need to run my week or even my fortnight or month differently to mm -hmm. that. Absolutely. And I think that's where, we all have to know ourselves. Know thyself is mm -hmm. the key phrase here, isn't it? Definitely. And, you know, when I had like a more of a, a, a client facing role, for example, with the property, property management company, you know, it had a different tempo to it as well. So I would have Monday to set up all the appointments, you know, to make sure, you know, liaising with clients, future clients and all the rest of it. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, out in the morning, seeing properties, doing appraisals, those afternoons getting those appraisals out to the clients the same day, you know, getting the refurb specs all organized. And then Friday, basically tidying up, you know, all the mess that had been created during the week. So th that's that I think would be an example of a more client facing week, for example. But, you know, we're, as we said, you know, right at the beginning of the podcast, we are such wonderful, unique individual creatures that I think that's the important thing is to realize our uniqueness and double down on that uniqueness and try and stay in flow by that so for example if you are an in uh, you know more of an introvert and you're more interested in detail and focus one of the key things that will need to be managed is is not that you don't like people that's not true it's not true that introverts uh, you know don't like people they love people but very often that brings an, a really significant energetic load to them. So if they have been out at uh, a networking do, they're going to, unfortunately, they're probably going to pay the price the next day and they're going to need a bit of time by themselves to recharge. And if they've gone to a conference, let's say, like a weekend conference for three days, the reality is they will probably need a week to recharge their social bat batteries. Um, and yes, whereas... whereas an extrovert we thrive on it we thrive on being there and and then we we find that we come home and we want more of it and actually yeah. for us being at home alone not having any contact with people that has the same drain we can do it and we know how to focus and we know how to get things done you talked about writing you talked about your projects paul that requires focus and mental uh, attention but after a couple or three days of doing that, you would feel the same way as somebody who is an introverted person to feel after being three days in the company of 50 or 60 people. Mm -hmm. it, it, you're right. It has a different energy flow to it. And it's being mindful of that, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So before we finish, I would like to just ask you a quick question about your current project. Tell mm -hmm. us about this amazing project that we see on social media. I see you with your hard hat on and it's fantastic. <laughs> but tell me a bit more about it, Paul. Well, so I've got a couple of projects going on. So I've got a little project that's going on, um, which is just going to be a lot of fun. It's really in interesting. And then I've got the bigger project on, which is the project which had the fire in the HMO. And for me, it's again, it's like the people. So who's the person? So I'm using two different designers um, who I've known and I've never worked with them in this capacity, but I've always admired their work. And um, yeah. And so it's like, well, who can I work with that's going to make this project interesting and exciting for for me? The the one which is the, the bigger project has a, a much more significant degree of complexity because it's 
um under the supervision of the insurers it's using you know the insurers have sent their surveyor out they've appointed their own principal contractor and so i I, I, you know, I've had to make sure the person that I've used for that is able to cope with that as a system and meet all of their needs and demands, which are which extensive, which are really significant. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. They need they, they need every you know t crossed, i dotted, and all the rest of it. So that's the road that we've gone that, down with them. In short, it's just going to be just a phenomenal place to live it's gonna be it's an astonishing design it's really interesting it's really novel um obviously we've got to watch the pennies um because as i've heard you say rightfully on podcasts you need to think about every pound you spend am i going to get a return on this pound you know as much mm -hmm. as i'd like to put in gold taps you know is it you know is that going to be reflected in the rent and i think that's a very profound point you make there so yeah, really exciting project. It's going to be really um, novel design. It's going to be really, really interesting. And that will be put back on as a house share. Interestingly, we've migrated away from the room by room model. We have still have a few of those left, but we focus primarily now on like, the classic house share model. Give them a really nice home, bring them in as a effectively as a, fam a family unit, and then largely leave them to it. And that's working with the geographic location and the style of houses we have. That is that that's working really, really well. It adds a little bit more diversification to the portfolio as well, which naturally I'm pleased about. Great. Well, Paul, it sounds like you're going to have an amazing year this year. We look forward to seeing you. Uh, I see you regularly in your wetsuit on uh, social media. Um, and I always think, oh, gosh, you're a brave man doing that in January. <laughs> but you are a big one for getting into your flow, whether that's in the water or in business. And I want to thank you very much for your words of wisdom today. It's been a, really an honour and very interesting to listen to you. And anybody who's interested, maybe lives around the Leeds area you must get yourself to Paul's breakfast meeting but you have to book it up quickly because those tickets sell okay. out very very fast okay. it's an exceptional uh, Friday morning meeting once a month and um, we will put the link below in the podcast notes so you can click through and have a look at that do go along because the room is full of incredible people I've been there once very kindly uh, I was a guest of honor with Paul and it's really a tremendous tremendous place to learn about property and of course Paul has an inner circle uh, mastermind as well which I'm sure that he will tell you about if you go to the breakfast so Paul, just thank you so much for your time today. Really absolutely. appreciate you coming along. And it's been absolutely great to hear from you. And I hope 2024 uh, absolutely delivers because uh, you, you certainly deserve it. I am highly confident this could be another interesting and exciting year of adventures. And I'm really looking forward to it. And I'm very, very grateful to be invited on the podcast once again, Wendy. It's always a pleasure. You're welcome.